Okay, what does this all imply for the Netherlands? Um, the first one who is going to give a view on this difficult question is Sheila Shitalsing. I think almost everybody here knows her. She's been chief editor of the political section of the Volkskrant and of the economics section of the Volkskrant. Now she's a freelancer, works for her own, but you can read whatever she thinks, I think about twice or three times a week in the Volkskrant. Uh, and she really knows how to stir up a debate. Sheila, the floor is yours. In these interesting times, it is perhaps good to start off with a few cliches, just to make things easy. I will follow it up with a thesis, the pooling of sovereignty can actually make the nation state stronger. And I will round it up with an open question, because of course I don't know either how we as a nation should march on in these bad times. First, some cliches about the Dutch and how they relate to the big bad world out there. Well, the Netherlands almost single-handedly invented modern trade and the transboundary financial system. We all know the story of the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, founded in 1602. It was the world's first multinational corporation, the world's first company to issue shares. We all know the story of the Dutch Almight in the spice trade culminating in the Golden Age. Trading is in our DNA. Developing profitable businesses wherever on the planet that is what Dutch people do. Perhaps that is the reason why the anti-globalization movement never gained real momentum in this country. Here, the trilemma between democracy, sovereignty, and globalization, as outlined by Danny Roderick, has always been decided in favor of globalization and democracy. In the Netherlands, it was never a big issue that a small, open economy like ours thrives on international agreements in the WTO, in the IMF, in the European Union, etc. Rule-based, firm agreements carved in stone. That's what you need. Otherwise, this humble nation of 16 million people and its modest army that is getting smaller by the day will be crushed by the likes of China and Brazil. Can we actually speak about an erosion of democracy simply because Joe Average doesn't have a say in agreements on, for instance, intellectual property in the WTO? No, of course not. That's part of representative democracy. We have outsourced decision-making. Does bowing to international rules mean handing over sovereignty to another body? Definitely. However, the alternative is a far greater threat to the small nation state. In the alternative, only the big boys rule, and there's no one who looks after our interests. As a small nation, we need rule-based globalization. It's salvation of the nation state. And European cooperation has been the ultimate salvation of European nation states. It was the main thesis of the late British historian, Alan S. Milward. As, and he was right, of course he was right. As Milward said, for the sake of national survival, the state after 1945 needed European coordination as a protector against an ever stronger Germany. In this view, the European goal is not a federation, but an alliance of strong nation states, which can be strong simply because they pool their sovereignty. As Milward stated, without the European Union, the nation state could not have offered to its citizens the same measure of security and prosperity which it has provided and which has justified its survival. In the Netherlands, we tell each other a lot of stories that aren't true about Dutch elites who blindly and irrationally adhere to this preposterous ideal of European Union. Well, that's a myth. Actually, back in the 1950s, the Netherlands joined the founding EU nations kicking and screaming never losing sight of its own interest. In 2000, I had the privilege to speak with four men who were the main negotiators for the Dutch when the Netherlands in the 1950s decided to participate in the Monet-Schumann plan for a coal and steel community, the forerunner of the current EU. The goal was to create a Germany that was aptly described by Winston Churchill as impotent but fat, prosperous but without the means to start another devastating war. 
These men whom I spoke to, whom are all deceased now, told a forgotten story. It's a story of how the Netherlands actually prevented that too much sovereignty was handed over to the high authority of the coal and steel community. Because back then, Prime Minister Willem Drees was not a big fan of these European plans that included Italy and France. Actually, he was appalled by the idea of an alliance with Roman Catholic nations. He felt certain that if you hang with Catholics, you will surely catch fleas. Because of this reluctance, the Netherlands was extremely powerful in the negotiations regarding the coal and steel community. Without Dutch participation, no Belgian participation. And without the Benelux, no France, hence no community. The Netherlands feared that it would be crushed by the large countries, Germany, France, Italy. Therefore, the Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs, Jan van den Brink, proposed the Council of Ministers with a veto for every national representative as a safeguard against supranationalism. To this day, even small countries can frustrate EU legislation if they believe it to be detrimental to their national interest. That's a Dutch achievement. We should be proud of that. In later years, the Netherlands has always been keen on pursuing national interest. Gerrit Salem got her money back from Brussels. The Netherlands joined Schengen, the Euro, not because our politicians went crazy, but because money-wise we could profit, or at least that was the perception. So the EU is a marriage of convenience. So how about Joe Average, a guy we call Henk in the Netherlands, who is supposedly permanently angry and very much anti-Brussels? How does he fit into this picture? Well, maybe he's yet another myth. Not sure, but maybe. We can conclude that from two very recent surveys. One is the Social State of the Netherlands by the Social and Cultural Planning Bureau, and the other is the Atlas of European Values. These offer a wealth of data, and they paint a completely different picture. A picture of an intensely happy, quite optimistic and extremely wealthy nation with high levels of social trust and relatively low levels of xenophobia. The Netherlands scores lowest on the misery index in the EU. The misery index is a measure of unemployment plus inflation plus budget deficit. And even in these turbulent times, the Dutch on average rate their lives a 7.8. Now that's a triple A nation. Sure, there's still a lot left to be desired. And of course, everything was better back in the old days. And yes, increasingly people do fear the future. But in politics, the focus seems to be on this person who would like to lock the country and throw away the key. Of course, only after all the Muslims have been shipped off to England. This person has either not participated in this service or simply does not exist. This contentment is reflected in Occupy Amsterdam as well, our local branch of the Occupy movement. When they set up their tents in Amsterdam, I wrote in, in the Volkskrant, first we will laugh at them, then we will regret that for their anger will prove to be the tip of an iceberg full of rage. Boy, was I wrong. Occupy Amsterdam remains on the fringe. The tents are populated by a handful of professional protesters who spend their days discussing the food supply in the camp. In April, Prime Minister Mark Rutte said in Parliament, I am willing to transfer heaps of sovereignty to Brussels in order to save the euro. Nobody took to the streets to protest against this erosion of the nation state. Actually, two thirds, two thirds of the Dutch population is in favor of EU membership, even now, which is a pretty decent score compared to other European countries. Of course, the Dutch do not want to waste money on lazy Greeks if you frame the question like that. But there are no real strong objections against the Dutch call for a strong budget commissioner which in the end implies some sort of fiscal union. It looks like a Dutch interest, it walks like a Dutch interest, it, maybe it is a Dutch interest. As the union has grown into a community of 27 member states, a strong European Commission is in the interest of small countries like the Netherlands, as a counterweight to Germany and France, as a counterweight to Mercosur, especially in these dire times. Just like the Council of Ministers used to be back in the old days when there were only six of us. I want to conclude with an old anecdote. During the negotiations for the coal and steel community some 55 years ago, the then French Prime Minister Guy Mollet and the German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer 
left the negotiating table to solve an argument in private. They took a walk in the garden. Willem Drees, who was, of course, also there, was watching them from behind the window. And at one point, the French guy grabbed the German guy by the arm in a gesture of affection. This was not even 10 years after the war. So that's what, that was a big moment, but Drace was completely oblivious to this moment. He just muttered, oh no, there goes our money. <laughs> was Drace right? Well, we'll know, we'll know in, 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 in a few days. An hour from now, Nicolas Sarkozy will outline his solution to the Euro crisis. And maybe on December the 8th, when there's this final European summit that will solve all our problems, maybe by then we will have a political union. Who knows? Thank you.